Father, we thank you that you are the rock of our salvation. We thank you, Lord, that you are unchanging. Lord, when we hear of wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, we're not to let our hearts be troubled. And yet, Lord, tied to each of those events is the loss of life. People stepping into eternity, Lord, many of them apart from you, and great suffering. But Lord, you've at least warned us what man will do when left to himself. They'll go further and further away from what is right. Truly, Lord, we are living in some interesting times. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your ways are right. And blessed is the man or the woman who puts their trust in you, because the Lord is good. And so, Father, may our hearts be strengthened in this generation that we wouldn't lose our voice to stand for truth, to be salt, to be light. They don't have to agree with us, Lord. We just have to be faithful to tell them what the Lord says and let your Spirit work on their hearts. Thank you for this time, and we pray your word would just renew us and strengthen us and freshen us in our walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week we saw at the end of the chapter that Joab was over all the host of Israel after Amasa became Amasa. There are some of you remember how to remember the name. And don't forget long ago, Elimelech was eliminated. Good, okay, good, you're starting to get it. Joab was over all the host of Israel. Benaiah, who we will keep an eye on, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites, chapter 20, verse 23. And over the Pelethites, and Adoram was over the tribute. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Eliud, was recorder. And Shiva, the scribe, was the scribe. And Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And Ira, also the Jerethite, was a chief ruler about David. And so chapter 21, and then there was a famine. Now we think chapter 21 is written sort of after the progression of things in David's kingdom. Clearly it, it happened after he showed kindness to Mephibosheth, who was Jonathan's son that was dropped when the battle didn't go well for Saul and for Jonathan and the sons of Saul. And then his nurse picked him up, dropped him. He was lame in his feet. And eventually David finds out about him, shows him kindness, lets him sit at the table. You remember him from all that we've been through in the last few chapters. But it seems after he showed kindness to Mephibosheth, somewhere earlier in his reign, this event occurred. And this is now being added by the author sort of as an appendix to the book or post-thought to the things we've been through. But he records now that there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, The famine is for Saul and for his bloody house, because Saul slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto him, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. So wherefore, David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? Turn left to Joshua 9. Let's review. Joshua chapter 9. How many have heard of Joshua? Okay, three, four of you, good. Chapter 9, left turn. Came to pass, chapter 9, verse 1, where all the kings on this side of the Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys and in the coasts of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, when they heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wily. And they went and they made as if they had been ambassadors. And they took old sacks upon their donkeys and wine bottles, old and ripped and bound up or repaired, and old shoes and clouded upon their feet, and old garments. They wore their bell bottoms and their old sandals and out of date clothes. They took their bread, but it was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua into the camp of Gilgal, and they said, We be come from a far country. 
Make a peace with us. And so verse 7, the men of Israel said to them, well, how do we know you don't dwell among us? How should we make peace with you? And they said, we're servants. We're, where are you from? And they said, verse 9, we've come from a far country. We left our bread was hot in the oven. We heard what you did to the Egyptians. And our clothes and our shoes were new when we left. Look at us. And all these things were new when we took off because of our long journey. Verse 13. And the men of Israel took, or took a stock or look of their victuals and of their clothing and of their items. But they did not ask counsel the mouth of the Lord. So they trusted with their eyes. Can things be deceiving with our eyes? You know, how many have learned over time things are not always what they appear to be? How many have learned that? You know, you, you meet someone or some circumstance or some offer or something looks too good to be true, turns out to be too good to be true. And interesting how often we can be deceived by our sight. And interesting how in Corinthians it says, for we walk by faith and not by Sight. Things are going to get rather strange in this world before the Lord calls his church home. And remember when the disciples went to the Mount of Olives and they said, tell us, when will these things be? When one stone will not be left upon another and the end of the age and the sign of your coming. And the first thing Jesus said is, take heed, you be not deceived. The first warning he gave, don't be deceived. And then he told us, wars will come, famines, pestilences, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, but the end is not yet. He gave us all these warnings, but the first thing was that we wouldn't be deceived. And then we get into 2 Thessalonians, and it tells us that that day of Christ will not come until there comes a falling away first. The word is apostasy, a turning away from the truth within the church. Deceived. And then will that lawless one be revealed? the son of perdition, whom the Lord will destroy with the brightness of his coming, with the sword out of his mouth. And he'll sit in the temple of God, showing himself he is God. Deception is the hallmark of the last days. And the more we seem to look at what's going on in the world around us, the more it seems like deception indeed is, is the norm. It's like agreements don't mean what they mean anymore. Promises don't mean what they mean anymore. And even phraseology used at times by whether politicians or judiciary, or whatever, don't mean what they say they mean anymore. You have to read it carefully and then read between the lines and wait a minute, is that really what they mean? Deception. Well, these men forgot to ask the Lord and they trusted their eyes and they trusted their common sense and they made an agreement with them. And it came to pass, verse 16 in Joshua there, chapter 9, after three days they went over the hill and poof, they were neighbors. And they said, what have you done? You guys lied to us. And they said, well, yeah. We heard you're supposed to wipe everybody out. We've heard what happened to Jericho. We heard what happened to Ai. We heard what happened to Og and Sihon and the people of Bashan. So yeah, we lied. All the princes were upset. But verse 19, the princess said, listen, we've sworn to them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. Verse 20, this we will do. We will rather let them live, lest wrath come upon us because of the oath which we swore unto them in the name of the Lord. So we can't touch them because we swore to them in the name of God. Did they take their oaths seriously? Why? Because they made the oath in? The name of the Lord. You know, if you go to Israel today, and even in the history of the Jews, any time God's name is written on a piece of paper, they won't destroy it. So each year when people go to the Western Wall, on the women's side or the men's side, and they put notes in the wall. Every at set intervals, they collect them, they take them, and they actually put them down in the tunnels underneath the Temple Mount. They won't destroy them. They preserve them there in the foundation of the temple because any time the name of God is on a piece of paper, the Jews treat it as holy, as sacred, and so they won't destroy it. And that part, because of that heritage of the Jews, aside from persecution and attempts to destroy the word by pagans, that is why we have been blessed with such a rich collection of scripture like the Dead Sea Scrolls because they so revered the name of God they were very very particular about how they copied and how accurate the texts were that were handed down from generation to generation they take using the name of God very seriously 
And so when they made this oath with the Gibeonites, after they realized they had been hoodwinked, they said, well, we can't break our oath. We promised in the name of the Lord. And if we were to break that oath, then the wrath of God would come upon us because in his name we made this promise. How many of you are married? What did you guys make to each other when you got married? Vows, otherwise known as oaths. Who'd you make them in front of? Well, a bunch of in-laws and neighbors and yeah, 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 never mind. Who who is the one you really made them in front of? The Lord. Does that mean it'll always be easy? If you say no, you're in trouble the whole car ride home. But you made an oath. Yeah, well, we weren't saved when we made that oath. Okay, well, you're here now and hopefully saved now, so now that you know it's still an oath. It's interesting how when we pledge, when we affirm, when we swear before the Lord we're going to do something like be faithful in a marriage covenant, God expects us to keep it. And no, that's not always easy. And yes, I understand what kind of husbands and wives are out there. I get to meet them from time to time and sit in meetings with them and and all that. I got it. But sometimes it's that commitment to the commitment that allows a marriage to go through some deep valleys, some deep troubles, and yet come out the other side healed and stronger than it was before the trouble because they were committed to one another. These guys were serious about their oaths. And so it came to pass there was a famine. Back to our chapter, 2 Samuel 21, in the time of David. David sought the Lord three years of famine. Nothing to do with weather. This is God's judgment. And he said it's because of Saul. Saul. And his bloody house, because somewhere along the line, Saul attacked the Gibeonites. Gibeah is not far, five miles or so from Nob. It could be when, um, oh boy, total brain freeze. Doeg, thank you. It could be when Doeg, the Edomite, attacked the priest. Remember when Elimelech was eliminated and then Doeg went in and attacked the whole town of Nob and destroyed all the priestly families and only Abiathar fled away with the ephod. Remember all that we went through in 1 Samuel? It may be at that time that as that was being poured out upon the priesthood, the Gibeonites were forced to be hewers of wood for the tabernacle and for the temple and drawers of water for the service of the Lord. So they basically were brought into servitude, brought into the nation, forced to cut the wood and to provide the water for the worship of God of the tabernacle and the temple. They became essentially part of the worship of God. Interesting in the plan of God, that would constantly put them around the worship of God, the things of God, and so these Gibeonites would be hearing constantly about the goodness of God. And so many of these Gibeonites essentially were just shuffled into the deck of Israel. So when Saul was doing this, perhaps it could be that attack at Nob, that also in his, quote, zeal, he went after the Gibeonites. But somewhere during his reign, he slaughtered some of the Gibeonites, whom Israel had sworn not to attack 400 years before. 400 years. How old is our country? 200 and change, right? 400 years. When God tells us if we believe believe upon his son, we will receive everlasting life, does he mean it? Yes. When God makes a promise or God makes an oath, it's going to come to pass. So now there's famine. So David called the Gibeonites Gibeonites in chapter chapter 21, verse 2. What should we do? What shall I do for you? Verse 3. Wherewith shall we make the atonement? that you may then be able to bless the inheritance of the Lord. And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver nor gold of Saul. We don't want repayment. By the way, in the case of killing someone, whether it was innocently or intentionally, you could not buy your way out of it. You can check that in Numbers 35, 31. You were not allowed to offer money either to leave the city of refuge or to pay your way out of killing somebody. Wasn't allowed. So we don't want gold. We don't want silver. They understood the law. We don't want any of these things of his house. Neither for us shall you kill any man in Israel. And David said, well then, what you shall say that I will do for them, what do we have to do? And they answered the king, the man that consumed us, Saul. 
and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel, the territories. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord. Interesting. What if David had killed seven of Saul's sons? How would that have been viewed? He took over for Saul. He now goes out and begins to wipe out Saul's heirs. What would he be behaving like? Any other eastern king who slaughters and wipes out all the heirs of the previous king. Interesting how they said to him, we'll hand this. You give them to us, we will hang them up unto the Lord in the Gibeah of Saul, and whom the Lord did choose. And so the king, King David, said, well, then I will give them. But King David spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. Why? They made an oath. And so David won't break that oath. And besides, as you're going to find guys to hang for someone else breaking an oath, that's a reminder you shouldn't break your oath. How many got that? So David wouldn't touch him because of the oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. And so the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aya. That was the one that Abner went into, that Isbosheth called him on. What are you doing going into Saul's concubine, which caused the kingdom then to be ripped out of Isbosheth's hands? Abner came to David, handed back the kingdom to him, and you remember all that happened with that. So they took two sons of Rizpah, whom she bare unto Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, named after his uncle, and of the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul. Now this could also be Mariab. Remember when David was supposed to kill a hundred Philistines and take their foreskins? I remember that. How many did he show up with? 200. And instead of getting Mariab, Saul gave her away. Remember that? The oldest daughter. And so then eventually he gave to him Michael. Either Mariab died and Michael raised those sons for her, or they wrote the wrong sister's name down, and it is Mariab who had the five sons, and they took him from her. You can look it up for yourself, but either way, it is from the union of Mariab and her husband, Adriel, and these sons were also used. And so he took the two sons of Rizpah, five sons of Michael, or Mariab, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholothite. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together, and were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. And you might be thinking, this is weird. Wait a second. If you murder someone's family member, what do you have to be concerned about in Israel? The avenger of blood. What does the avenger of blood have the right to do? If you shed man's blood, then by man's hand they will shed your blood. And that goes all the way back to Genesis 9 as they came off the ark. If you take someone's life, premeditated murder, you forfeit yours. That's what God said. Well, that's not fair. No, it's a deterrent. If you're going to take someone's life, you better be prepared for yours to be taken. And so in this case, the Gibeonites are not Israelis. But the revenger or the avenger of blood still applies. Even though they are strangers, they are equally treated under the law of God. So whether you don't follow this or you think this is strange, the fact is their family members were murdered. They were murdered in violation of an oath or a peace agreement. And so the retribution at the time was then you will take those who committed the crime and and put them to death. So these sons were turned over for it. Wow. And so he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites. And they fell all seven together, verse 9, and they were put to death in the days of the harvest, in the first days of the beginning of the barley harvest. And this is how it goes with the law. How many would like to live under the law? How many would like to live under grace? Was that everybody? Was there any law hands up? I love what Paul says to the Galatians. You foolish Galatians, having begun in the Spirit... Will you now be made perfect by the law? Having begun by grace through faith, that not of yourselves, a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How is it you went from being saved by believing in Jesus to now you're adding legalism to your walk? 
What happened to you? And it can be very subtle when we begin to get our own works righteousness in the Christian walk. I didn't have my quiet time today. (laughs) I had my quiet time today. Did you have your quiet time? Is that what saved you? Is it a good thing to have? Yes, but not if it becomes legalistic. It's sad, but we can take almost anything in our walk with God and turn it into ritual, turn it into formalism, and turn it into, I'm better than you are in my walk, or I'm not as good as you are in your walk. And we begin to slide away from just being in love with Jesus. And it happens, and we look at the history of the church, and pretty soon there's tradition, and there's dogma, and there's things that have crept in that are so important to the church that have nothing to do with Jesus. We were saved because he first loved us. Amen? And when we understood how much he loved us, how could you reject a love like that? God touched your heart. You realized you were a sinner. And the shock was he was actually willing to forgive you. And as you understood that there was this offer for salvation, this offer to be right with God and forgiven, you realized, I better hurry up and embrace this while while it's still offered. And you clung to Jesus and breathed, hey, I got saved and hey, things have changed. And it was all new and fresh and exciting. Why? Because you were in love with them. But if you're not careful, pretty soon you start adding restriction after restriction after restriction. Are you saying that I should go watch trash and talk trash and eat trash and drink trash? And No, no, no. I'm not saying that either. But it's a shame when you go from being in love with the Lord to being in legal walk with the Lord. It begins to just suck the life out of that joy and out of that sense of, hey, he loves me this morning. Hey, even though I just completely crashed and burned and screwed up, he still loves me. You you get into this, you're, you're attaining instead of you're abiding. And it slips in so quickly. Pretty soon you're the Christian. Instead of the Christian, just a warning. I prefer to be under grace because if I got what I deserve from the law, there'd be a little pile of ashes here next to the stool. Well, Rizpah, when this was all happening, the daughter of Ahiah, she took sackcloth, verse 10, and she spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of the harvest, March, roughly, time frame, until... The water dropped, roughly October time frame, to the fall harvest, dropped upon them out of the heaven. That would signify the drought had ended, the famine had ended, God began again to bring the rain. She suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night, which include lions, or can include lions. This was brave. She does not fight against the king's decree. She does not fight against the penalty delivered against the house of Saul for violating an oath in God's name, but she at least makes sure that dignity is shown to their corpses while they wait to be put to rest. And by the way, back to this whole oath thing, Samuel Goldwood said this. He had a little comment, very interesting. It is discussed in the Talmud by Kimji. And by the way, the question comes up, well, wait a minute, what about these guys are put to death for the work of their father or grandfather? Isn't there something about that? Listen to what they said. The conflict between the punishment inflicted on Saul's sons and the teaching of Deuteronomy 14.16, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for their fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin, is discussed in the Talmud, rabbinical writings about the Old Testament, and by Kimji. Rabbi Yohanan's comment was, it is better that a law of the Torah should be overridden than that God's name should be publicly profaned by the failure to keep an oath. So there you have the Jewish mindset on, it's okay to set aside a provision of the Torah so that we wouldn't violate the name of God by failing to keep an oath. They were serious. So she kept the carcasses from being defiled, Rizba did this for the whole spring and through summer into fall. And so verse 11, it was told David what Rizba, the daughter of Ahiah, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went, and I think he did it personally to show there was no animosity on his part towards these individuals. He went and he took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh Gilead. You know, those which had stolen them from the street of Betshan, where the Philistines had hanged them after decapitating them when Saul was killed on Mount Gilboa. And he brought him up from there, the bones of Saul, and the bones of Jonathan, verse 13, his son, and they gathered the bones that were hanged, 
of those who were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, they buried they in the country of Benjamin. And Zelah, in the sepulcher of Kish, his father. So they were buried with their ancestors. And they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God was entreated for the land. Interesting. Innocent blood shed, the Gibeonites, and a breaking of an oath in his name brought this judgment of God. Question. Where does that leave the United States? Retribution for innocent blood shed and a breaking of oaths in his name. What does it say on our currency? In God we trust. Can we say that is the practice now of those in government? Not really. There are a few. Sobering thought. And so they buried them. And the Lord was entreated for the land. So verse 15, Moreover the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. What does that mean? What does it mean? He's getting old. That's what it means. Come on. He's, uh, you know, here's the problem. Up here, you can still do it. Down here, down here, the message hasn't been received. You know, it's, it, it's so funny. One of our elders had messed up his knee one point, and he's playing softball, and he said, My mind and the ball were here, but my knee was still over there. And that was it. So that problem of in your mind you can do it. But your body has other things to say about it. David waxed faint. He's getting older. And Ishbi Benab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed about 300 shekels of brass, about nine pounds just for the head of the spear and weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, Joab's brother, the guy who was going to pull out the javelin by Saul's head when he took the cruise of water, that Abishai. Abishai, the son of Zeruah, succored him. He helped him, and he smote the Philistine, and he killed him. Then the men of David swear unto David, saying, you, That's it. You're in retirement. Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. The blessing, the prosperity, the direction of Israel. And it came to pass after this, that there was yet again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Shibiachai, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant, and there was again another battle in Gob, verse 19, with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jeriogram, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, who is called Lahmi in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam, kind of like a fence post. And there was yet a battle in Gath, and there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers, on an every foot, six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, he said, Hello, my name is Anigo Mantoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Oh, sorry, that's the other six-fingered man from the movie. <laughs> if you've seen the movie, it makes sense. If you haven't, oh well. Twenty-four toes and fingers. Must have been tough to find gloves. Apparently, this uh, genetic trait of giant, giantism, so to speak, caused him also to have extra fingers, toes. He defied Israel, verse 21, and Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. And I guess you could say it was a complete shutout for the giants. That's all I have. Yeah, it's bad. Chapter 22, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song, In the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies. Question, we're going to be raptured, yes? How do you know? Well, we've been coming for a while and you keep telling us that. No, how do you know? In my father's house there are 
Many mansions, John 14, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you may be also. That's where we get the origin, the origins of the rapture. Paul then comments on it in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed, or not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Suddenly this corruption puts on incorruption. This mortal subject to death shall put on deathlessness, otherwise known as immortality. He also mentioned it to the Thessalonians, chapter 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I don't want you to sorrow as those who have no hope concerning those who have died. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so he will bring with him those who die in faith. The Lord will descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. We are going to be delivered from all of our enemies. And the last enemy is death. What kind of songs will we be singing? Soon and very soon we are going to see the king. David, when the Lord had delivered him out of all of his enemies... Bust it out with this song. And it starts in chapter 22. It is also paralleled in Psalm 18 with a few minor changes. In the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul, David said, he brings forth praise and said, the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh, Jehovah, is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. Who's yours? Visa, MasterCard, line of credit? Who's yours? Government, the Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress, my deliverer. Think of all that David's been through with his enemies. The God of my rock and him will I trust and nothing else. He is my shield. He is the horn that is the strength or power of my salvation. Hey, he's asking for salvation. Did David earn it by his works? Name a few of his works. Adultery, murder, numbering the people, which we'll get to. He is the power of the horn of my salvation. He's talking about the power of the salvation of God. My high tower, a, strength, a strong place with strength to hide in. My refuge. What's your refuge? A few beers? That was my refuge before Jesus. Oh, I got to go visit family. It's going to be at least five to get out there. That was my refuge. Oh, I got a big test. I better go do some shots. That was my refuge. That's where I came from. I used to have to drink kale pectate and Maalox to keep my stomach together for all the drinking I was doing. That's where I used to be. I used to go to high school drunk because life was so overwhelming. And then I realized God loved me was willing to forgive me my sins and make me his son by faith. And suddenly those things weren't needed anymore. He is my refuge, my savior again. Thou savest me from violence. God delivered him from all kinds of trouble and ultimately his wrath David deserved for his sins. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I be saved from mine enemies. That should be a song. When the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. You ever felt overwhelmed? Like, when is it going to stop? When can I get a breath? David understood. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. Verse 6, the snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. That would be known as prayer cried unto my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. He hears us when we ask him for help. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth, God's power. He intervened. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils. That's an anthropomorphism in the sense anthropomorphism. It's assigning a human attribute to the divine personage of God. Smoke out of his nostrils. Think of like an angered animal in a sense. Fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. 
He bowed the heavens also and came down. Darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Or could it be that was regular light darkened by his glory? Through the brightness before him were the coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and disconfitted them. And the channels of the sea appeared. How many submarines did David own? How many sonar systems? Deep sea radiological mapping technique? How many did they have? How in the world could a guy like this know about channels in the sea? Are there channels in the sea? Most definitely. How could he know about it? Because the manufacturer told him about the options. Channels of the sea. This is 1000 BC, people. The channels of the sea, the foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breast of his nostrils. Just a... He sent from above. Who is that fulfilled in? Howard Cosell? Somebody, who's Howard Cosell? Who is that fulfilled in? Jesus. Turn to John chapter 6, right turn. He sent from above. If someone told you they were sent from God above, that they were here to pay for the world's sins, and that through faith in Him you could be saved, don't you think you should pay attention? Yes? Okay, John chapter 6. He fed the 5,000. They went back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. The people realized he had left. And so when they came over, they said to him, well, how would you get over here? And he said, listen, verse 26, you're not looking for me because of the miracles. You're looking for me because you had food. Don't labor for the food that perishes, verse 27. But labor for the meat that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give unto you. For him has God the Father sealed. And they said to him, Well, then what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe by faith. Believe on him whom he hath sent. And they said, therefore, while still filled from the 5,000 loaves, or the loaves for the 5,000, What sign will you show then? that we may see and believe. Our fathers ate men in the desert, as it's written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said, I say to you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gave you the true bread from heaven. Verse 33. For the bread of God is he which came down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Well, then, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me and believes shall never hunger. He that believes on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that you've also seen me and you believe not. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven. Is that clear? I came down from heaven. Not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me. That of all which he has given me I should lose nothing. But I should raise it up again at the last day. Resurrection. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I came down from heaven. Back to our psalm. David said, verse 17, God sent from above. Yes, he did, through the son of David. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me and from those who were too strong for me. You know, our trials can be overwhelming. But when we pray and ask for help, are we asking from someone like us? I bring 5'8 to the table. My trials definitely seem taller than 5'8 at times. But when I lay them at the feet of God, who's been invited to the party? The one with all power, all authority, all dominion, and all knowledge. 
Your trial this evening may seem overwhelming to you. It may seem like there's no way out or somehow God forgot about you. But as you pray and you call upon the Lord, you are calling upon the one that your trial is so simple for him to solve. Moses could take his hand, put it in his chest of his garment, pull it out, leprous as snow. Moses could take his hand, put it in, pull it out, healed and as pink as a baby's skin. God has all the power. And when we bring our trials and we bring our struggles and we bring even our struggling against our flesh or back to struggling just to be faithful in your commitment or to love like Jesus loved in your commitment. When you bring to him your problems and ask for his help, his resources are not limited. Ours are, but his aren't. And all things are possible with God, which is why we need to ask him. My trials were too hard. God delivered me from the strong enemy, verse 18, from those who hated me, from those who were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place, the idea of delivering. He delighted in me. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. How would you fare? Yeah, me too. That's why I need grace. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. Many feel this was perhaps written before Bathsheba. I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. Someday when you're gone, it's going to happen. You have a one in one chance. And they find your Bible. What kind of notes will be left in it? When your kids or your grandkids find your Bible and they begin to flip through it, what will be underlined is important. Where will the notes be of where God spoke to your heart? What would the legacy or testimony be from your time alone with God as they begin to go through? What will you leave behind off the record, but yet on the record in your Bible? What will they know about you as a person in your walk based on what you left behind in your testimony? Verse 22, I have kept the ways of the Lord. I have not wickedly departed from my God. All his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him. And I have kept myself from mine iniquity. Hard enough just to fight iniquity in your heart and in your mind, let alone out in the world. But David said, I've kept myself from these things. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of his eyesight. Or in his eyesight. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. How many would like some of that? Then what do you have to be? Merciful. With the upright, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. With the froward or the perverse, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. Basically, God deals with man as they deal with him. Interesting. And the afflicted people, thou wilt save. But thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. Finish this for me. God resists, but gives grace to the humble. Very important verse, James 4, 6. For thou art my lamp, O Lord. I have... In the building upstairs, I have actually a little lamp. It was a gift given to me on one of the trips to Israel. And when you think of a lamp, you know, you think of like, a, you think when these flashlights on the wall, mag light, you know, their lamps will fit and smaller than your palm. One larger hole for the oil, one smaller hole for the wick, and a little thing you could grab. And it's about this long, about this thick, and it's this tiny little thing with a flicker of light. I have one sitting there upstairs that is 2,000 years old. It's so funny. I had someone, oh, here, it's a lamp from Israel. <laughs> it's 2,000 years old. Hi, hi. <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, when you understand what he meant when he said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, it gave you enough light for the next step. Just enough light to be sure you wouldn't step aside Either way, or you wouldn't stumble on an object right in front of you. It was just enough light for you to be faithful to make a good and a right step. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet with each step. Carefully walking, carefully looking, 
carefully keeping in the right path. But now we wanted to say, Thy word is a halogen unto my feet. So we can go, I don't like what he's got ahead. I want to go that way. Let's, let's go that way. And that's why he doesn't show us the whole path. Because we'd have opinions about how we didn't like it. Or ideas of how it would work better if it was handled the way we think it should be handled. Why are you all laughing? <laughs> well, you've been there. And by the way, it's God's grace that his word is a lamp unto our feet for each step. Because if we will not take the step in front of us, why should he show us anything else? And if we are refusing to take a step in front of us or step in the right direction, to know the rest only leaves us with a greater accountability before God for failing to walk in his will. He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Step by step. Because sometimes each step in itself is its own trial just to bring our flesh into submission to his spirit. My lamp, you are, O Lord, verse 29. The Lord will lighten my darkness, and yes, he will. For by thee, David said, I have run through a troop. Now look, running through a host of the enemy in armed conflict, that's a pretty significant statement. God literally just helped run them through troops. You empowered me. By my God have I leaped over a wall that would be in battle. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler or a shield to them that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord? Who is a rock save our God? There's only one. God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect in spite of David's failures, weaknesses, and errors. He maketh my feet like hinds' feet and setteth me upon the high places. Interesting, the hinds, the females, were considered swifter than the males. And the women are going, preach it. But the idea is he makes me sure-footed. And if you get to Israel and you see the rocky heights and in Gedi and other places, one lost step and whew, you're done. Makes my feet like hinds' feet, sure-footed. He setteth me upon my high places. You might not think that's important here. But in those days, you always took the high ground. Because then you were fighting going downhill. And your enemies had to try and attack going uphill, which gave you the advantage. Always to be in the high ground was the advantage. Makes my feet like hinds feet. He sets me upon my high places. He teaches my hands to war, David said. That a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. As he dealt with Israel's enemies. You know, there's a surprise coming. Israel has technology that is better than ours on a number of things. Because they, are, they get one chance. If they mess up, they have one bad day, they're finished. And so they're still, I believe, still fighting uh, or still flying the F-4 Phantom Jets from the Vietnam era. If you remember what those are. They put in their own avionics. They get jets from the United States. They put their own avionics in and military planes. They are very advanced. You know, when they had to go deal with Syria a number of years ago and take out a nuclear site, the Syrians never saw them coming or going with their advanced radar. And so the tendency can be when you have that kind of technology to trust in the technology instead of the God of Israel. And it's interesting in Ezekiel 38, 39, which is coming sometime soon when they're invaded by Russia and part of Turkey, it seems, and Iran or Libya and Persia and the other things that are going to Persia, Iran. When these nations come in, God is going to supernaturally intervene and destroy five, six of their armies. How exactly he does that? Not sure. But he's going to do it in such a way that Israel realizes their technology is not enough. It's the true and living God who is their defense. And it will bring revival. And in fact, it may well be what kicks off those 144,000 Jews who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. It's all going to be clear when it plays out. But right now we're just getting hints. But there's a day coming when Israel again is going to be delivered by their God and their eyes are going to open and things are going to begin to change. He taught them the war. He brought them through their enemies. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, verse 36, and the gentleness, thy gentleness. Wait a second. What half of the Bible are we in? 
We're in the Old Testament, right, everybody? What did he just say about God? Lay gentleness. Well, I like the Bible, but I don't like the Old Testament God of the Bible. Somebody help me with what's wrong with that. He's the same. To those who throw themselves upon his mercy, they receive mercy and forgiveness. To those who try to go head to head with God, they receive his judgment. He's the same. David said, your gentleness has made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, so that my feet did not slip. How many would appreciate that in the snow? How many would appreciate that when you're javelining and using swords and fighting in a bloody, muddy field? If you go down, what happens? They stick you. Having your feet not fail you in a battle like David would be in would be everything. My feet did not slip. That's more than you know. That's a huge asset in that kind of warfare. I had pursued my enemies and destroyed them. I turned or they turned not again until I had consumed them. And I have consumed them and wounded them that they could not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet for thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me thou hast subdued under me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. Remember when Joshua took their Jericho and then Ai and the leaders and he made the men stand on their necks and then they killed them? The idea is he brought them under dominion, put them under their feet. It was a sign of subjection. David is saying, my enemies have been brought into complete subjection, subdued under me, that I might destroy them that hate me. In verse 42, they looked, but there was none to save. They even looked unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street and did spread them abroad. Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people, not only as enemies outside, but even in his own household. Thou hast kept me to be head of the heathen. A people which I knew not shall serve me, and that is ultimately messianic. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. In fact, the king of Hamath, Toy, did that when David came to power and made an agreement with David and began to serve as a vassal in chapter 8, verse 9. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid out of their close places. The Lord liveth, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And what a difference compared to the dumb idols of the Philistines, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and the Perizzites, and all the other ites, and their dumb idols that have eyes and can't see, and mouths and can't speak. The Lord liveth. Blessed be my rock. Exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. It is God that avengeth me, and bringeth down the people under me. And that bringeth me forth from my enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen. And I will sing praises unto thy name. He is the tower of salvation for his king. And showeth mercy to his anointed unto David. And to his seed forever more. It took 51 verses to say, Thanks. Fifty-one verses to say, thank you for being faithful. So when you're raptured, no, I don't know the day or the hour. But what song will you be singing? Na, 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 hey, hey, hey. I know it's not a worship song, but it's tempting. Let's stand, let's pray. Lord, we know the day of our redemption is drawing near. Nearer than when we first believed. So much more near than even the last generation that we've seen in the church. That wondered if the walls would come down and if Europe would reform. And now it's commonplace. They scratched their heads how all the world could behold two prophets dead in the streets of Jerusalem in real time. And now it's on our phones. When right was still pretty much right. And wrong was listed as wrong and at times deviant behaviors. Just one generation, how much has changed? 
Lord, may we have an expectation in our hearts. Sometime soon, you're going to call us home. We may be the last witness some of the people around us ever see. And that can be pretty sobering. God, strengthen us. To those who are perishing, we're a savor of death unto death. But those who are being saved, we're a savor of life unto life. And you asked, who is sufficient for these things? None of us without your spirit. God, fill our hearts afresh tonight and let us be salt and light in this world that is so confused. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, may our hearts be filled with praise as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.